to In Studio. This is the show where we actually share with you a lot of the great happenings in and around our community. Today, we are at the Majestic Theater, and we are going to hear a lot about not only the current program that they have running, but what's to come in the new year. And I'm real excited because theater is a time when we can come and learn and share and grow and be together as we explore the arts and ha as the arts teach us a lot about history, a lot about family, and a lot about the world. So I welcome Danny. Danny Thank Eaton. You. Tell us about your new show. Well, it is a little bit of history and a little bit of family uh, for sure. Uh, the play is called The War and Walt Whipple, and uh, it was really inspired by my grandparents, my, my dad's mom and dad, and in that family, there were the two of them, of course, and four boys. And so, you know, it was pretty much, you know, sportsmen and athletes and that kind of, you know, fishermen and hunters and that kind of thing. So it was like very, very male. And uh, World War II came along and all four boys uh, went in the service. And before they shipped out for overseas for combat duty, they all got married and sent their new wives back to my grandfather's house for the duration of the war. So the house kind of just flipped. Mm -hmm. You know, went from all men to all women. <laughs> and and the, the, one of the family jokes uh, growing up was uh, my grandfather was just damn lucky to survive the war. And of course, he never <laughs> did anything but survive his, his daughters-in-law, you know. Yes. But, so that was the inspiration for, uh, for, for the play. And then it was uh, just a lot of um, all kind of family anecdotes that I tried to to uh, figure out how to weave into a, a sort of narrative, you know. So the play takes place uh, on one day, starts in the morning, ends late at night, and, you know, so that was the challenge. Well, and it's a very important time, and I can only say that because my father was in World War II. Mm -hmm. and, um, and like you say, you know, what happens in the family, what happens, you know, in that turbulent time um, on the world stage. Uh, anything that you can say really impacted your family? Well, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things it did. Um, you know, it was funny, that generation, I think my dad and, and my uncles, they didn't really talk too much uh, about it. Um, I think they just, after the war, they just kind of carried on with, with their lives, you know. Um, but what, what sort of struck me a little bit is like, I think about my own grandkids now and um, how there's, uh, there's so many generations removed now from, from that uh, uh, really important part of our, our history when, particularly when um, the, the country uh, was so unified at, at that point during World War II and, you know, we're so seemingly divided now, you know. Um, and I think there are just sort of lessons uh, there that, um, like my little grandkids, uh, need to learn, I think, you know. Yeah. So, uh, in some respects, I, th I sort of think of this play as like passing on to, mm -hmm. to them in, in a sense, you know. Okay. And uh, I mean, even now, I mean, I think about people uh, who are adults now, but who didn't grow up in the 60s, you know. And, yeah. and the 60s was, you know, oh my God, you think about 1968 and everything that happened in 1968. Um, uh, and, and the changes that, ca that came from there, you know. There's so many people today who don't have that experience, you know. Yes. And the years teach a lot, and as much as we don't want to think about it, and I want to also, with this show, just pay tribute to every veteran out there Absolutely. Um, who served, and, and my husband also served. So I feel like this is such an important part of our community in terms of understanding their stories. So if you could just recall your brothers and, and maybe share a story about each of them that you think comes through. About, well, uh, uh, you mean my uncles? Your uncles, yes. Yeah, my uncles, yeah. Well, uh, in part, in the play, one of my uncles um, married this woman uh, from Oklahoma. And, and she was sort of a mixed heritage. Uh, and um, he didn't, in writing home, he didn't talk much to, about her. Uh, so they didn't really know what to expect when he sent her home. So she spent four days on a train, you know, coming from uh, Oklahoma to, uh, to Springfield, Massachusetts. 
And um, when she finally got off the train, they were just shocked. She was like a, a, a waif of a woman. She had polio with braces on her legs, you know, and walked with these suit canes, and, and, uh, and she was pregnant, and um, they were just like completely shocked, you know. Um, so that was one story. And then, uh, you know, another kind of funny story um, that was related to me about my grandfather. Uh, he went on a, a tear one morning because there was just one bathroom in the house, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, he was in there trying to shave and the women all had their nylons hanging all <laughs> over the place. And he went kind of crazy. And he took all the nylons down and took them out to the backyard and hung them on the clothesline, you know. <laughs> and, and he kept saying, I damn near cut my throat trying to shave, you know. So it was those kind of little stories that I ended up putting in the play. Yes, yeah. yes. And it must have been for you a great way of looking back through the eyes sure. of others in your family. Yeah. And and what do you want the grandkids to really know about well, that time? Well, actually, in 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 my family now, there uh, in this my generation, there are only three of us left. It's mm -hmm. my uh, my sister and and my cousin, and um, so you know, life life moves on as it, as it were. And uh, so, you know, I'm sort of interested in my own kids understanding uh, where they came from, yeah. really, you know, and, and then my grandkids as, as well, you know. And tell me about your, you know, growing up in Springfield. Uh, tell me about your own journey here and uh, with your family. You know, I, I think it was a, uh, you know, Western Massachusetts, I don't know how long you've been here now, but it's, you know, it's a pretty, um, it's not a, like a really strong cultural area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really too, too diverse. Um, and, and so you have this, you know, growing up, um, almost this leave it to beaver kind of, you know, thing in the, in the 50s. And I think it wasn't really until, uh, I, I got in the service and, you know, was stationed in California, then stationed overseas, and, and uh, that, you know, I began to experience uh, the, the world and the, our country differently and, mm -hmm. you know, things like that, and then college, of course, after that. Um, so it was a, you know, it was a nice place to grow up, but I think it's sort of limited in, in a way if you don't get out, you mm -hmm. know. So, I've encouraged all of my kids to expand their horizons, you know, just don't mm -hmm. feel like uh, um, they have to be stuck in one place, you know, they have to stay in one place. Yeah, you know? and now it's certainly grown where the experiences is, you know, have definitely um, probably been a little bit more than the 50s. Sure. And, um, and it's growing every day. Where did you go to school? Tell me about where you went to school. Well, I went, went to uh, the High School of Commerce in Springfield. Oh, great. Um, I basically, I went there, I was at, <laughs> Uh, uh, tech high school um, for the one day and then my girlfriend was up at the high school of commerce so I said eh, I'm going up the hill <laughs> so I went up there with my girlfriend good uh, good and how about college yeah college um, uh, was actually after the service I mean I did some night classes at uh, AIC before uh, the service but then there was the big call up for Vietnam and all of that so after the service I uh, enrolled in Hoyo Community College and I did a couple semesters there and then a semester at UMass and uh, then I transferred to Amherst College and got a nice scholarship for there and and then subsequent to that did a master's work down at Wesleyan. So. Great, great. Yeah. And and where did you find the wonderful book that got you into the theater? I'd, I'd say that's my dad really. Um, he was uh, a, a great storyteller, you know, he would just pull stuff out of the air. It was kind of amazing. He never wrote stuff down. We always encouraged him to write stuff down. He never did. Um, I think he just had more fun uh, uh, fabricating these fantastic stories. And um, so I know I always imagined myself, uh, even as, you know, a young child, five, six years old or something, as as being a writer or a storyteller, you know, and, and I think today 
even that's what I do. I tell stories, you know, I, but I tell them on, on, the, on the stage. Yes, yes. Rather than the page. You know? Yeah, yeah. So. And that's so exciting. And I think that that's the beauty of what you're doing, especially with the show. If you were to um, share a message with the veterans and those who have served out there, what would you say to them in terms of inviting them to the show? Uh, well, um, you know, it's a World War II era play set in 1944 and there are there just aren't very many uh, of those veterans left really. yes. um, but um, it would be nice to, to see them and, and we have you know vets from who are subscribers here who mm -hmm. are uh, from the Korean War era and from Vietnam certainly and, and even later now the Gulf Wars and, and so on and you know, I saw something online uh, yesterday the day before about um, America's involvement in wars, going back to the Revolutionary War, mm -hmm. and you know, in uh, how many hundred years of our history, we've been involved in war. You know, eighty percent mm -hmm. of that history in mm -hmm. one war, one mm -hmm. conflict or another, somewhere in the world. You know, which is kind of shocking, actually. Yeah. You know, and you know, back in my day, of course, there was there was the draft, and and mm -hmm. you know, it was an obligation and I think I kind of miss that I mean I think other countries in Europe I know have um, have an obligatory service mm -hmm. requirement um, and you know I think that's kind of a good thing it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in the Navy or be in the Army but you know there's some sort of national service and um, I, I think that engenders um, some patriotism, you yes. know, some caring about your country and your place in, in your country, you know, and uh, I, th I think that would be a good thing. That's kind of a unusual approach, I guess, for a liberal guy like me to, <laughs> to suggest some sort of national service, but oh, yeah. I think it would be a good thing. Yeah, to anyone who has served, this is at least a story they can be proud of. Yeah. And, um, and I think if it's anything like my dad who came home and he planted a flag at the end of the street, and up until the day he died, it was there. Yeah. And, um, and that's the spirit we're talking about, which right. is wonderful. Um, so tell me, uh, after we finish with this show, you're going to be moving into another show for January called The Mountaintop. The Mountaintop. Um, a remarkable, remarkable play uh, about Martin Luther King. Um, and such an iconic figure in, in American history. Uh, but I think so many people just see the icon, yes. and uh, while this play is fictional and it's set in the Lorraine Motel uh, the, the night before the assassination, and it's two characters, it's uh, Dr. King and um, a, a housekeeper who works at the mm -hmm. motel named Kame, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really a conversation between the two of them, but you see, you know, it starts out to be a little flirtatious at first, yeah. and, uh, and then it starts to take some deeper turns. And but what's really fascinating is you, you know, you get to see beyond the icon. Yes. Uh, and um, you know, because it's easy to, it's easy to, I think, ignore. Mm -hmm. Icons, yes. you know. I mean, you just accept them as an icon, yes. and, and that's as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to see beyond that, I that's think. Right. And so, I'm really excited to uh, have the show in, in front of our subscribers, and in front of our audience. And we've got a terrific actor um, coming in to do it, uh, Jamil Mangan, who I saw uh, perform this play down in Hartford. I think probably four years ago or mm -hmm. something like that. And, uh, got to meet him afterward, and um, I think a remarkable performer, and, and uh, yeah, very much looking forward to that play. Yeah, and I think one thing um, that I think about when I think about this play is the fact that, you know, these icons had um, thoughts, they had stories right. well beyond any of us could, you know, read and see through the media. Right, and, right. Um, and that point of reflection where you can actually sit and, and say, you know, um, this is not a side that I tr have traditionally seen, but it could be 
uh, one of those conversations. Yeah, it's the commonality be, that that we all share with Dr. King and other people who uh, are these icons. You know, um, that's so important. And I mean, I look forward to. Uh, th this is obviously a very, really intimate theater, and mm -hmm. and um, you know, there's all, in this space in particular. You know, there's always kind of a sharing that goes on between the actors on stage and the story that we're telling and the people who are sitting out in those chairs. And um, that kind of int intimacy uh, really, I think, lends itself to uh, all the things we do here, but in, in particular to the mountaintop and, you know, uh, the story of Dr. King. Yes, and when you think about Dr. King and um Reverend Abernathy and that mm -hmm. whole setting mm -hmm. there at the Lorraine Mattel, you say, um, what were some of the unscripted moments? Was there anything that you can remotely remember from your time seeing the play that really sparked you? This is an important conversation. No, you know, but I, I not in particular, but you know, I had a friend of mine who's, who's a playwright, African-American, and uh, he wrote a play, this was many years ago, uh, and I'd like to get in touch. He's retired now. He lives down in Panama, of all mm -hmm. places. But I'd love to get in touch with him and, and read that play again. But it was a story about uh, someone who was assigned to kind of watch over Dr. King that night, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, he sort of neglected his duties. Mm. You know, he was sitting in a motel room, uh, I think in the, maybe the same place watching TV mm -hmm. instead of doing what he was supposed to be doing. Right. And then the events uh, that took place, that took place. And, and the burden uh, of, that burden of neglect, you know, what? I thought that was kind of a remarkable story yes. to, to look at. You yeah. know, and it was a whole entirely different perspective that looking at uh, that whole incident. You know? Yes. Well, we're all going to look forward to really being here for that show and to enter in that dialogue, which will be, mm. to me, uh, a great time. So going back to the show, what's the runtime for the show? For the, um, it's on now, so. Opens tonight. Opens yep. tonight. Yep. And we run for uh, six weeks. I think it closes December 9th. And okay. you know, we perform Wednesday through Sunday, six shows a week. Mm -hmm. uh, because we Thanksgiving lands somewhere in the run, I think we have some Tuesday mm -hmm. performances that we have to work around that holiday. But yeah, essentially it's Wednesday through Sunday. Good. Anything surprising for you in doing the story, doing the story for the entire play that was kind of a shocker to you and that and something that you think that your family should, you know, really, really, you know, hone in on as they see the show? Um, I don't think that so much, but uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I teach a playwriting workshop at the Springfield Museums, and we have our last uh, get together to, tomorrow morning. And um, you know, what I've been telling those folks through this process, and some of them came to see our, our dress rehearsal last night, I mm -hmm. invited them for that. You know, that uh, a, a, a script is always a work in progress, mm -hmm. you know. and. Uh, even last night, I was making little changes mm -hmm. on it, you know, and I'll probably continue to do that mm -hmm. through the entire run of the play, you know. So, um, so I think it was a, an important thing for them to understand, you know, yes, that yes. Uh, uh, these things aren't, aren't perfect, and audience is different every night. You yes. never you know how responsive they're going to be or how um, reflective they're going to be, and you know, so. It's a, it's a, it's all very fascinating, I think, you yes. know. Well, we're going to enjoy seeing the storyline unfold, and I want to thank you for joining us today. I think this is great for our community, great for all of the people who just want a glimpse of life, of what life can be in our community. Mm. So I thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you. I'm very happy. Well, thank you for joining us for In Studio, and we hope that you will not only come down to the Majestic Theater and enjoy these shows from November, December, and January, and we hope to see you in the spring with our new spring lineup. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.